The latest Great Depression. What is depression? Depression is a common but serious mood disorder. It causes severe symptoms that affect how you feel, think, and handle daily activities, such as sleeping, eating, or working. To be diagnosed with depression, the symptoms must be present for at least two weeks. National Institute of Mental Health. It's important to remember that there are different types of depression and it affects different people in different ways. What's going on in the body? Neurotransmission is a function performed by the nervous system. It generally occurs at synapses of a neuron. This is where neurons relay chemical and electrical signals to each other. In order to communicate, they release neurotransmitters, such as serotonin. Serotonin is a type of neurotransmitter that is synthesized from tryptophan. People can only receive tryptophan from the foods we eat. We do not produce it. Foods that contain tryptophan are milk, meat, vegetables, and others. So in order to have higher serotonin levels, people must eat the correct foods that allow us to synthesize it. Both cells found within the gut and neurons in the central nervous system synthesize serotonin. People correlate serotonin with a multitude of behaviors, most notably depression. Drugs such as Prozac are agonist drugs, that is, it increases serotonin within the synapses. Hormones are chemical messengers within the body. Organs secrete them and they travel to specific tissues and affect behavior. Hormones and neurotransmitters are similar in that they both send messages, except hormones send them through the bloodstream. Hormones and neurotransmitters cooperate with each other. Stress hormones, such as cortisol, can have short-term or long-term effects on the brain. In response to cortisol, the body can shut down immunity and reproduction so that all energy is focused on the stress a person is facing. Scientists found a certain correlation between neurotransmission of serotonin for people with a certain allele and depression. The gene is called the serotonin transporter gene, and the different alleles a person can have, or polymorphisms, are the LL, SL, and SS alleles. People with the SS allele have transcriptional inefficiency, which means their brain doesn't get enough serotonin. The CASPI study shows a correlation between having the SS allele and depression. The conclusion is that if a person has the SS allele of the 5-HTT gene, they can have a higher reactivity to stress, which puts them at risk for depression. Gene environment correlations demonstrate how people with a genetic risk can have more sensitivity to specific environments. Epigenetics, factors beyond genes, can express and stop the expression of genes. It is important to note that genes cannot affect behavior unless they are expressed. The environment and surroundings of a person also play a role into gene expression. Once people realize that having a gene does not mean they are condemned to expressing it, they can take steps in order to prevent the gene's expression. They could change their diets, try to limit exposure to chemicals, or even just try to be conscious of stressful environments. Neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to reorganize itself in response to the environment throughout the lifespan. Neuroplasticity occurs normally in the nervous system and it's what allows our brains to be adaptive. Referring to the Tao experiment which compared the brains of adolescents with depression and with normal brains during an fMRI while taking Prozac, people find it's justifiable that Prozac causes neuroplastic changes, normalizes the brain, which leads to lessened depression. Depression prevalence rates. One in five people will experience clinical depression at least once in their lifetime, with major depressive disorder affecting almost 15 million Americans every year, around 7% of the adult population. While a large number of people experience depression, only around half of those who are depressed seek help or treatment. Among those, roughly 54% of Caucasians, 40% of African Americans, and 34% of Mexican Americans with depression seek help. Once they reach puberty, women are twice as likely to develop depression than men. Common factors leading to this are puberty, menstruation, pregnancy and childbirth, and perimenopause and menopause, all of these factors dealing with hormonal changes. Regarding depression in men, men are more likely than women to mask depressive symptoms and avoid seeking help. Depression among adolescents and young adults. There has been a seen increase of depression among adolescents and young adults. From 2005 to 2014, there was a 37% increase of adolescents reporting a recent period of clinical depression. In 2015, roughly 12.5% of adolescents ages 12 to 17 experienced at least one major depressive episode in the past year in the United States. One risk leading to this increase is sleep deprivation. 
Sleep deprivation has not only been seen to increase one's risk for depression, but also increase the likelihood of a depressive relapse. Due to the improvement of technology and increase in social media use, adolescents tend to stay up later and wake up later on weekends than they do on weekdays. This sleep timing reduces the likelihood that adolescents will obtain proper amounts of sleep. In the National Sleep Foundation's Sleep in America poll in 2006, it was found that teenagers used an average of four electronic devices after 9 p.m. This use of electronics is said to disrupt sleep as correlation was found between watching three or more hours of television and difficulty in sleeping. Other factors leading to an increase of depression among adolescents include improper diets and bullying, particularly an increase in cyberbullying. With an increase in depression among adolescents, an increase in suicide rates followed. Suicide is now the third leading cause of death among Americans ages 10 to 14 after intentional injury and malignant neoplasms, as of 2015. For both ages 15 to 24 and 25 to 34, suicide is the second leading cause of death, following only unintentional injury. Although not all suicides are a result of depression, depression serves as the leading cause of suicide in the United States. Risk for depression. There are many things that can influence your risk for depression. These things are called risk factors. Depression can develop in a person with or without these risk factors. However, your chances of developing it are increased with each one. Some of these risk factors include stressful events, family history of depression or other mental problems, uh, physical disorders, genes, and diet. All treatments can help with depression uh, because they all affect neurotransmission and circuitry. Try, try to choose what treatments that best fit an individual or take an electric method, which is the combination of, or mixing of treatments. A certain treatment is not best for everyone. No one size fits all. Uh, when choosing a treatment, many factors should be included such as culture, severity, and personal preference. In all treatments, benefits must outweigh the risk. All treatments have a high degree of efficacy, which means supported by evidence. Uh, this evidence is different for many countries, but in general is proven to be correct in a lab state. Depression treatments of the past. From the start of time, mental illnesses were put into one group of people that were widely thought to be possessed. This way of thinking progressed for a great amount of time until the Renaissance. At this time, many changed their thinking towards religion and started to think more scientifically. A book by Robert Burton speaked of depression, which was called Melancholia. In the book it said many ways to treat melancholia or depression. A couple of these treatments were exercise, a healthy diet, and music therapy. By the early 1900s, there were many more technical treatments such as lobotomy, electroconvulsive therapy, and psychoanalysis. In the 1950s and past, many medications were founded and some old ones were proven to help depression. An example of one is isoniazid, which was used for TB. Also many types of therapy were created in order to treat depression. Modern day treatments of depression. Treatments for depression can be put into three categories, medications, psychotherapy, or combination, and brain stimulation therapies. Brain stimu stimulation therapies are usually a last choice treatment when medications and psychotherapies do not work. Antidepressants such as Prozac affect neurotransmission and how your brain uses those chemicals to control mood and stress. Antidepressants are taken over a period of time to improve sleep, appetite, etc. until mood lifts. This time period is usually over a 6-12 to 12 month period. This could be different depending on severity. An individual should keep taking this medication no matter how good you feel until the doctor and you have agreed that you don't need it anymore. Also an abrupt stop of taking the medication is not good because of the withdrawal effects. Psychotherapy. There are many types of psychotherapy. This is mostly called talk therapy, or to be less specific, it's counseling. Some of these treatments are CBT, IPT, and PSD. Cognitive behavioral therapy uh, helps to change negative thinking to be more positive. Interpersonal therapy helps a person with troubled relationships. Problem solving therapy helps a person deal with stress and other events that may cause risk to them. Brain stimulation therapy. This primary includes electroconvulsive therapy. Recently, ECT has been very effective and is more humane. The patient is put under and given a muscle relaxant before given the therapy. There are some side effects, but usually has a greater benefit than the risk. The Stigma of Depression The stigma of depression and mental illness is an ongoing problem in our society that only amplifies the severity of depression. Kevin Briel describes the problems caused by the stigma of mental illness by saying that it's the stigma inside of others, it's the shame, it's the embarrassment, it's the disapproving look on a friend's face. 
It's the whispers in the hallway that you're weak. It's the comments that you're crazy. That's what keeps you from getting help. That's what makes you hold it in. Kevin Briel is not the only sufferer who is silenced by the stigma. UnitePersight.org defines the stigma of mental illness as the devaluing, disgracing, and disfavoring by the general public of individuals with mental illness. This stigma, in some cases, has even led to individual discrimination, in which those affected by depression are deprived of employment and general well-being in their community. Above individual discrimination, the stigma has led to a trend that is perhaps even more problematic. As previously mentioned, around half of those affected by depression don't seek help, often in fear of what others will think. Until we erase the stigma of mental illness, depression rates are not going to change. In a society where depression is one of the leading causes of death among young adults, it's only reasonable that we take measures in making those affected by depression feel safe and supported. It's time for people to understand that depression is a sickness, not a weakness. As Kevin Brill pointed out in his lecture on depression, we are so accepting of any other body part breaking down except for the brain. And that is ignorance in our society that we must overcome if we want to see any change in this problematic epidemic. The first simple measure that we can all take to eliminate the stigma is to educate ourselves and others. As a society, it is our responsibility to grow a better understanding for depression. After we educate ourselves, we need to take measures that extend beyond simple wishful thinking. We need to take action and stand up for people suffering from depression and know how to help, rather than turning away in judgment. Simple steps like these will make a big difference in how depression exists in our society and how we choose to react to such an important illness.